In this video, we'll use Agisoft Metashape to make a CAD model of this train car from a series of photographs. We'll also create a texture map that can be wrapped around the CAD model to give it a realistic appearance. We'll begin with a brief overview of photogrammetry, go over the basics of how to shoot the photos, then we'll cover the necessary steps in Agisoft Metashape. Let's get started. Years ago, when I was new to working in CAD, I thought you needed to use a laser or structured light scanner to get high fidelity captures of 3D geometry. Those kinds of scanners are excellent for precisely capturing the finest details, but they also cost thousands or tens of thousands of dollars. Photogrammetry, on the other hand, is the process of creating a 3D asset by photographing a real-world object. Photos are taken all the way around an object, and then the images are fed into a software that aligns the photos in virtual space to generate the 3D form. With some practice, you can get surprisingly high-quality results with photogrammetry. A Google image search of the term photogrammetry shows that the process is often used with drones to capture large-scale landscapes and buildings. The process can also be used to capture smaller items like people using arrays with many cameras that are positioned around the subject. But even without the use of drones or a high-end camera rig, we can get very good results just by shooting photos with a cell phone and then using Agisoft Metashape for the processing or one of the many free programs that are available on the web. Let's cover some photogrammetry shooting tips from Agisoft's user guide. First, we need the images to overlap significantly. So rather than just shooting four pictures from each quadrant, as shown in the example here on the left, we would want to shoot in the pattern like shown on the right, where we move slightly to the side for each new shot. This slow overlapping progression in the photos around the object enables the software to better reconstruct it. If photographing the facade of a building, we would not want to rotate from a single location, but would instead want to look perpendicularly at the facade, take a photo, step slightly to the side, and so on. And if photographing a whole room, we wouldn't want to rotate from four different locations looking outward, but would instead want to put our back against a wall and point the camera toward the far opposing wall and then step slightly to the side around the perimeter of the room. Also keep in mind that photogrammetry doesn't work well on shiny or monotonous surfaces. In the tool room example that I showed in my previous video, the metal cabinet was both shiny and monotonous and that's why it didn't get captured right. So to get the cabinet to show up better, I could have put sticky notes on it or little bits of tape, or I could have just covered it in talc powder to reduce its sheen. With photogrammetry, image resolution matters a lot. So by giving the program more pixels to work with, it's better able to reconstruct the geometry. The user guide suggests 12 megapixels or higher but the cameras on our phone have gotten to be so powerful in recent years that you more than likely already have what you need. Many photogrammetry programs can use GPS location to improve the alignment of the images. So make sure that location tracking is turned on on your phone. And it's a good idea when shooting photographs for photogrammetry to make multiple passes at different heights. So in this example, if we were shooting a human subject, you can see how with a single loop of photographs at eye level, we would be missing key areas below the chin and on the top of the head. So in addition to the eye level loop of photographs, we should take another loop from up high looking down and then another loop from down low looking up. To get started in Agisoft Metashape, we need to import our photographs and we can do that by going over to Chunk and then right click on it and go to add photos then navigate to where your photographs are and select all of them so i'll click on the first one i'll drag the slider down i'll hold shift and click on the last one to select them all and click on open and now you can see we have 88 cameras in the chunk and now let's right click on the chunk and go down to process align photos and I recommend using these settings. So we've got generic pre-selection turned on. We have the uh, accuracy set to high. Uh, we're using estimated. We're going to set the key point limit to 400,000, the tie point limit to 10,000, 
and make sure that adaptive camera model fitting is turned on and click OK. And this is going to take a minute, so I'll pause the video. Now that the first point cloud has been generated, we can take a look at the result. And you can see the caboose, that train car is here in the center. And uh, um, Agisoft has picked up a lot of points that are out in space pretty far away, the trees and uh, grass and, and, and things like that that are off in the distance are showing up. Um, I'm navigating around by holding down the left mouse button and dragging. If we want to pan, we can hold the middle mouse button and drag. If we want to zoom, you just roll the middle mouse button forward or backward. So um, you can see we have this uh, box that surrounds uh, the, the train car. Now that box is uh, what's called a region. And the function of the region is, uh, now that we've generated the first point cloud, we need to generate a, a second pass to make the dense point cloud. But we don't want Agisoft Metashape to have to calculate that dense cloud for everything that's here. Instead, we want to scale down the region to encompass just those objects that are important to us. So we can go up here to this um, region dropdown. And uh, right now, <clears throat> this is set to move. What we want to do, I think, to get started is to actually just uh, resize the region. So now we can grab these vertices and pull them over. And the thing that I always get hung up on with this step is that um, you can't really easily navigate around in space um, when you have it set to um, um, some of these options, like move, I think it is. So you just might have to click back on this um, navigation button sometimes to be able to get around. Uh, so anyway, let's go back to resize region. And we'll just scoot that over some. And let's look at this from the top view. And now that it's getting to be a bit smaller, it looks like we need to rotate it as well. So I'll click here and go to rotate region and get that lined up a little bit better. And then we can go back to resize. And we'll drag this vertice over. And let's look at it from a lower angle. I find the navigation to be a little bit weird with this program. OK, let's go down some. And it looks like it needs to get rotated again. Which way is it? Um, Let's see, rotate region, resize. Uh, now we'll have to rotate from this vantage point as well. And let's see. Trying to just make sure we're not cropping off anything that's important. I think that looks pretty good. Oh, uh, no, it needs to rotate a bit more. Let's just do one last rotation, and then we'll move on to the next step. Yeah, I think that's right. OK. so. Uh, now we need to go on to the next step to process the dense mesh. And so let's go up top to workflow and then come down to um, uh, build dense cloud. Okay, so um, actually, let me pull this window back up. So the first step that we did was to align the photos. And now we need to build the dense cloud. And then after that, we'll be able to build the mesh and texture. They have everything set up chronologically. Um, or, you know, in, in sequence here in a way that makes sense. So build dense cloud. And uh, I recommend using, let me just check my notes and make sure that, um, hold on just a second. For building a dense cloud, I recommend using these settings, medium quality, aggressive depth filtering, and we'll calculate the point colors. So we'll click OK. And this will take a minute, so I'll pause the video. The processing has finished. 
but it appears that nothing has changed. And that's because we are still set to, to look at the point cloud. So what we need to do is click on the option to the right, which is the dense cloud. And we can see the result here. And um, we really don't need the tree parts that are here. So we're gonna go ahead and get rid of those before we create our mesh. And we'll get rid of some of these pieces of grass that are hanging out in space too. There are different selection tools that you can use up here. The rectangular selection, we'll go ahead and just try that out. So you can see how that works. We'll select some of these parts of the tree and just push the delete key on the keyboard. And actually we might be able to use that tool for all of those problems there. Oops. We'll get rid of that little bit of grass that is hanging on space. So um, now you can see I'm, I'm wanting to orbit around, but uh, because I have that tool selected, it won't let me do that. So I need to go back and click on the navigation button there. So it just looks like a cursor. And let's go to the top view and see if we can find any other pieces that are kind of hanging off in space that we don't need. And I think we can get rid of that as well. Let me just show you a different tool. We'll go to the freeform selection. And this is nice for just um, getting into areas that are not shaped in quite a, a, a rectangular way like that other option. We'll just get rid of this bit of grass here. And let's look at this vantage point. I don't see any other big problems. So we'll go ahead and move on to process the mesh. So if we go, now that we've gotten rid of those little things that we don't need, we'll go up to workflow. And then, uh, so we've aligned the photos, we have built the dense cloud, and now we can build the mesh. So we'll click on that button and hold on. Just and the two main points I want to make here is that you, you want to set the face count to high so that it generates the, uh, the most complex mesh possible. And we want to calculate the vertex colors as well. So we'll click OK. And we'll let this process. Now that the processing of the mesh is completed, we have another option that has shown up up top here, which is Model Shaded. And so if we click on that, that shows us what our mesh looks like. And if we orbit up, you can see how we have some holes in the top of the train car, which I guess we shouldn't be surprised about because I took the photographs only um, with one loop around at eye level. If I really needed this to um, be a good finished complete uh, model, Maybe I could have shot another loop with maybe the camera held up on a pole or something so that we could look down uh, to collect that, um, that information. Um, and uh, for this, it doesn't really matter because it's just a quick example. But what this points to is the importance of just being very diligent about photographing all the parts of your model so that it will uh, end up being complete when you get it into Agisoft. And um, there are some things, though, that we can do to clean this up. What I really don't like about this edge uh, where the car goes up to the hole there is that we've got these kind of flaring up uh, surfaces that we don't need and, and which um, have this kind of consistent weird color. So I'll show you how we can get rid of those. Um, let's uh, go up here and we'll select the selection tool. Uh, I'm going to click on the drop down and go down to freeform selection. And then I'll just go through and very carefully try to select just those problematic faces and press delete on the keyboard. And actually, let me orbit down a little bit so that we're farther down looking up at the model. That looks a little bit better. I think this is kind of the vantage point from which we'll see the train car in VR. And uh, let's go back to that tool and we'll select more of those problematic faces and delete them. And this will be kind of tedious and time consuming, so I <laughs> won't make you watch the whole process. But uh, let me also point out that, uh, whoops. Um, I want to no longer have that selected. Maybe Control D will deselect. Hmm. How do we deselect that spot? To deselect, we can just click on any gray space 
in, in the area and it will let go of the selection. So I've just selected there. We can click there to deselect. And um, let's go back to the navigation button so that I can orbit over and look at this lamppost. You can see this is another place where I didn't get enough photographs for the lamppost to turn out well. So I'll go through and select these faces and delete this part as well. Before we export our model, let's look at how we can reduce its face count and the different options we have for creating texture maps. When reducing the mesh, we need to, on the one hand, make sure that we have a high enough face count to retain good quality in the 3D forms. But on the other hand, we want a sufficiently low face count to ensure that we'll be able to keep a high frame rate in VR. And just how high your face count should be depends on a variety of factors, so I won't give a prescriptive recommendation. But instead, we'll just look at this example to show how you might pick a face count that's optimal. Here, the original model is 800,000 faces, and it's been reduced to 200,000 faces and then to 50,000 faces. And in this example, the 200,000 face model has enough faces to preserve most of the detail in the geometry, but in the 50,000 face model, the geometry degrades quite a bit. Let's go ahead and reduce the mesh. And um, so the way that this works is first we'll go over to the chunk menu on the left and make sure that our high poly model is selected. And then we'll go to tools, mesh, decimate, and then we'll enter the target face count. And after we push OK, we need to make sure that we do not get rid of the default model because we'll need that later for the normal maps. Now let's build the texture. So if we go up top to open the build texture menu, uh, we're gonna, uh, instead of a normal map, we want a diffuse map, and we're gonna make a 4K map, which is 4096 by 4096 pixels. Now, um, uh, I, I settled on a 4K map because um, this is a fairly large object that has a lot of detail. If, however, you were gonna um, work with a smaller model that has uh, less detail, you could go to a 2K map, or say if it's a, a very large object with lots of detail, you could even use an 8K map. So once you've settled on the size of your texture map and you've settled the settings here, just push OK. And uh, now that that has processed, we can look at uh, the project in some different ways. So first, let's go ahead uh, and check out the texture that was just built. So we'll go up top to Tools, Mesh, and then View Mesh UVs. And when we created the texture map, the program took the photographic information uh, from our original shots and projected them onto the 3D model. It unfolded the model and um, uh, put all that into a texture map. So if we go up top to Model Textured, this is what the model looks like with the texture map wrapped around the 3D form. This gives us the best idea of what our model will look like in Unreal. If we select Model Shaded, on the other hand, this shows us what the model looks like with the colors applied just to the vertices. And because there are um, a limited number of vertices here, you see that um, the quality is less when we look at it this way. Now let's go ahead and create a normal map. And so the way that we'll do this is we'll select the poly, um, uh, the um, uh, 200,000 face model that we plan to export later on. And we're gonna project the details from our higher poly model onto this low poly one. So make sure that we're selecting for source data that high poly model. And we'll write this to a 4K texture map and go ahead and push OK. And once this is done, now uh, we have another way of looking at the model. We can see the normal map. So this gives us a sense of uh, what these small normal deformations are going to look like um, uh, in Unreal. Now we can export our project. So we'll go to export model and we will save this as an FBX with some meaningful name. And we'll want on the next screen here to make sure that we are exporting the textures too. And we'll do that just as JPEGs in this case. And this is a good time to also go ahead and save your file, your Agisoft file, in case you need to refer back to it later. 